Hey everybody, today I'm talking about another 10 board games that I've previously owned and have subsequently left my collection. And I'll hopefully give a reason why that is so, because normally uh, it's not normally as negative or as bad as it sounds. And to be honest, most of the time I still like these games. But let's get started with the first game today. So first up, I want to talk about Shadows Over Camelot, which is, I suppose, one of the pioneers when it comes to cooperative gaming. This was, I think, maybe the first game with the potential of having a traitor in the mix. As you take the role of these Knights of the Round Table, you're trying to manage your hand of cards and trying to beat these different missions, traveling around the board by forming these poker hands and you know fighting off dragons, uh, fighting off invaders, fighting off trebuchets. Um, all with the aim of trying to get these victory swords before the black negative swords overtake. Um, this game, I love the theme of it. I love the premise, I love the idea. You know, medieval Arthurian themes are my completely my jam, and I love that. And I think maybe that superseded the actual mechanisms in the game more than I would have liked. So I think this was a game that I wanted to like more than I actually did. Um, and the reasons for that was because, um, you know, this game is, goes back quite a long time now, you know, well, well over 10 years. And I always felt like the turns that each player took in rotation just weren't satisfying enough. You'd always find yourself uh, only being, being able to take two actions and you know, one of them often was just moving from one place to another and then maybe you would heal up or something. And it never really felt like you were getting much done on your turn, uh, in my opinion, especially if you were at a location on your own and you wanted to try and overcome the, the threat there. You'd have to wait you know, three or four times until it goes around the table before you could beat it. And that felt a bit churning at times. I always find it difficult and I struggle with enjoying games with limited communication when it's not a hard cutoff. So this one really did blur those lines with what was legal and what was not legal, what you could actually discuss and what you weren't allowed to discuss. And again, I find that kind of hard, that's that kind of thing hard to swallow and it just doesn't sit right with me. And I like I like precision in my games. And ultimately, those negative things overrid my um, or overrode my sense of love for the theme. And um, unfortunately, it wasn't going to stick around and it. It just was a bit long and a bit tedious for what it was, but I'd love to see a revamped edition and um, something just to spruce up because, again, I love the theme. So that is Shadows Over Camelot. The second game I'm going to talk about is a game I still love. This is a game called Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare, truly a hidden gem out there. If you love your Euro-style games, this is one certainly to check out with a really cool theme as you are trying to uh, basically pay these actors to perform for you. You're getting your set dressing. You are buying the costumes for your actors. The more lavish costumes you're getting, the more points you get. Loved all that. And on top of all that, I had a really great core mechanism where you would bid for the actions you take per turn. And whoever bid the fewest actions, so the potential to take fewer actions in their turn, would go first. And going first was a massive deal in this game. Uh, yeah, really loved so much about this one. The reason why this didn't stay in the collection was because there was very limited paths to victory. So you would either pick, basically go like a set dressing kind of... Uh, strategy, you'd go for a costume one, or you'd go for maybe uh, climbing up these different tracks. But I always found that you could get too much done with each game. And I, that's one of the things that actually is a, a massive thing that puts me off games, or at least keeping them in the collection, because this is still a fantastic game. But to keep me coming back and back and back and to actually cement a place on my shelves, I need to have that option of trying something different each time, just going different paths and being spoilt for choices. This one, I always felt like you know, by the end of the game, I'd always climbed up all the three tracks, tracks to the maximum limit, almost finished the other two strategies as well. Whereas that's just a bit too, a bit too loose for me and a bit too forgiving, where I like to be a lot tighter than that. But still, everything else in the game is fantastic. It looked gorgeous, love the theme, um, and it's still a highly recommended Euro for me. That is Shakespeare. Now, the next game is an immensely popular game, a kind of a gateway level game called Splendor. Now, I imagine if you're watching this video, you're very familiar with what Splendor is. This is one of the most stripped back and streamlined engine building games you could imagine. As you're collecting these different chips, you're trading them in to buy cards, and then cards give you discounts on future cards. Uh, really cool, it has a really nice cascading, a nice avalanching effect as things get faster and faster and faster, you get more discounts. Um, ultimately, I still like the game, I'll still play it now. The reason why this one left my collection was simply because it got replaced. So uh, another hidden gem called Kashgar 
replace this game for me, which is more card driven and has a bit more of a satisfying engine for me personally. But still, I, I give Splendid a lot of credit. I know sometimes it gets some criticism and people say that it's been completely just destroyed by other games. I, I don't believe that. I think it does have its own niche and it does stand on its own still. But to stay in my collection, unfortunately, it wasn't ever going to beat Kashgar to get to the table. Hence why uh, Splendor left my collection. Now, the next game is something completely different. This is Spyfall, or Spyfall 2. It doesn't really matter which one you uh, went for. This is a party game, a real tense and under pressure um, party game as... A bunch of cards are dished out at the beginning of the game. Uh, one person is going to be the spy, but everybody else has a location card, which are all the same. And the idea is that the spy is trying to listen in to all the other people communicate to try and work out where where they are, what the location is. Whereas the all the other people are trying to kind of gain each other's trust to understand that they're all on the same wavelength and are all gaining but we'll have the same understanding on what they are to try and wean out who the spy is. Because, of course, if they asked a question to the spy and they gave a wrong answer, then uh, the chances are they're going to have their cover blown. Uh, a real fun game. It has some massive laugh out loud moments. Um, the reason why this left the collection was because, number one, it required a high player account. Uh, I don't always have high player accounts. Number two, if there was ever a game with that pressure, uh, it's this one. You know, I know a lot of social deduction games get quite a lot of uh, criticism because people don't like being put on the spot, they don't like lying, and they can't do it very well. If you can't do it in, the, in Spyfall, then you've got no chance whatsoever. It is massively, you know, you're massively put in that crucible and you have to just bareface lie to your, uh, your co-players. Um, and you know, if you couldn't do that, it's not going to work. Um, and additionally, I think that the more and more you play this one, you find yourself going to the same questions and it becomes a bit of a rinse and repeat um, and that novelty does wear off. But really enjoyed my time with Spyfall. It's certainly a game I recommend everybody to try at least once because no doubt you'll at least get a few great experiences from it. But longevity, I don't think so. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is the Stouffer Dynasty. So this is by Andreas Stelling, who actually designed um, Hans Teutonica, which is still on my shelf here. He's a really great Euro designer. This one, I think, suffered from being a bit generic. It had a lot of normal, basically I call it normal things. This is a, a pretty standard Euro, some pretty simple area control. I did like one thing here where when you would kind of um, put people on these spots to claim these different regions, you would use a Mancala system to dot them out and when people went there in the future, they could get workers back, etc. Um, I liked the game, it was perfectly pleasant, but was it gonna stand out amongst all the sea of great Euros I had? It wasn't, it was never gonna get played again because there's too many games better than it. But that doesn't mean this is a bad game, it's just a good game in a sea of great games. So games like that just do not stay around. Uh, the next game I'm gonna talk about is a game from a quite a bygone era actually. This is Stratego. So Stratego was one of the first games I actually got into when I when I first got into the you know modern board game hobby um, as an adult. And this is a strictly two-player game as you have a bunch of pieces of different values. They're all facing away from your opponent, but you can see your own pieces and you're moving them on the board almost in like a chess-like fashion, moving one or two spaces at a time. Uh, and then once you collide with your opponents, you kind of reveal them and whoever's got the higher value uh, wins the battle and the other person will go off the board. However, there are some cool traps and things you could leave as you'd have bombs and if people walked into the bombs, they would die instantly. You had assassins which could kill more powerful characters and things. It was cool. I like the idea of it. Ultimately, I think it was a bit long. I think it was a bit static and a bit outdated, but there were still some things I really liked and I know a lot of modern games take a lot of DNA from Stratego and I think considering the age, I think it still holds up quite well, but now games are so much better than this one and um, you know it, it can't compete I think but I think maybe a lot of people who watch this would maybe at some time cross paths with Stratego and maybe have a bit of nostalgic uh, connection with it as I do. So uh, that's Stratego. Uh, next up I have a game called Stronghold and this is the second edition uh, and this is actually another game that was on my top 10 games that I think need a reprint. This is another two-player game and it's a massively asymmetrical game as one person 
takes the role of, I suppose, the humans trying to defend a castle, and the other person is the goblins and orcs trying to invade the castle and try to break in, climb the walls, use siege weapons, etc. I love the theme. This is an amazing theme. I love siege battles. I love fantasy battles. And uh, this game is that in a board game. Uh, unfortunately, it had some big issues for me. Number one, it was a massive bugbear to teach this game. Being so asymmetric and pretty complex and had a lot of intricacies, uh, it wasn't the easiest to get to the table. You always had to play it with the same person because, again, teaching it was too much of too much work. Um, and additionally, I think it could have benefited a lot from streamlining. It could have been had a, you know maybe thirty percent shaved off in terms of, it, of its game length, and all those things added up to the point where it was just sat on the shelf, never being played. So um, games like that, if they're not getting played, they're out of the collection. Stronghold out of the collection. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is Tao Long. Now, Tao Long is a real unique game, actually, a game that I found quite fascinating, and I did play this one quite a few times. This is a, another strictly two-player game, as you take the role of these Chinese dragons, and you are controlling these dragons around this, um, this grid by moving these Mancala stones around this wheel, and that would determine which um, kind of moves you can take and how you could snake around the board. The idea was that you were trying to kind of line yourself up to try and either bite your opponent's dragon or maybe even try blow um, blow fire on them, or to try and kill the dragon, try to make them shorter and shorter and shorter uh, until eventually they would die. You could add some real fun factor into this game by adding portals and things, and you could pop in here and pop out there uh, and kind of lay little traps for your opponent. There was so much I liked about this game. I, I really wanted to like it more than I did, actually, um, because I thought it was so whimsical. It was almost like it had this weird like charm to it. Um, but unfortunately, I think for the for the vibe of the game, considering it was supposed to be this big ferocious dragon battles, uh, you would move too slowly. It was almost like playing Snake on your Nokia 3210 in terms of just like slowly just jolting around and round and round and round, rather than being dynamic and flowing and fast and furious. It was a bit static, a bit a bit chunky or clunky. It just didn't quite feel right for the, the vibe and flow of the game. But very close miss because I, I like this one. I was fascinated by it and I did enjoy my time with it. And especially it's a, a beautiful, beautiful looking game as well. So that is Tao Long. Uh, next up, I have one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time. This is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. Uh, this is... I think one of the best civilization games still out there, uh, as you are starting with a bare bones, you know, you've got a few basic gatherers and basic resources, and your technology is gaining and gaining and gaining. You're starting to get armor and better weapons and uh, new colonies and new spaces are growing to. You've got to keep your people happy. You've got to build an infrastructure and get your government right. It's, it's brilliant. This is a fantastic Euro style game, a fantastic civilization Euro game, all based on cards. So it's completely card driven. Uh, lots of strategies you can go down. You can get leaders to do different things and take different paths. You can go like a warfare route. You can go a scientific route. All the things you'd expect. Um, all of that sounds great. And, it, and to be honest, this is still a, a game I rate. I still uh, give it my shield of quality. Uh, however, it's long. It's you know you're talking three, four hours, maybe more than that at a higher player count. You know in the in the world we live in today, people don't have time. We all work. We're all busy. Games like this hard to get to the table. I have loads of other games I want to play. Am I going to play three other games or am I going to play through the ages? I'm normally going to lean towards the three other games. Uh, and yeah, I think I like this game a lot more than the other people I played it with did as well. So I don't like people or kind of. Uh, force people to play games they don't want to play. I don't want to play games that everybody wants to play, and um, hence why, even if I love a game sometimes and people don't, they're gone from the collection because, again, it's a game, it's a hobby we share together, and um, I'm not doing it for my own enjoyment. So uh, that's why, through the ages, left my collection. And the final game I'm going to talk about on this episode is The Tides of Time. So this is another strictly two player game, however, this is a fast one. This only takes 15 minutes to play and it's actually a pass and draft style game that works brilliantly at two players so not normally uh, normally these games don't work well with two two players you normally want more people as you have a bunch of cards you're picking which one to keep and you're passing the rest of your opponent and going through that motion until you have a, a pan of cards and then in this in this game particularly the types of time you are trying to synergize these cards together because some cards might say you know, for every this symbol and this symbol you have you gain x amount of points or 
all of these cards are worth extra points, all these things. You're trying to pull them as best as you can together to try and get the most amount of points. And then once the round's over, you'll keep hold of one, you'll bin one off, and then you'll go again. And you'll slightly get ramped up, ramped up points. And I thought this game was magnificent for how, how few components there were. So there's only, I think it's 18 cards in the deck. And there's quite a lot of game here. There's quite a few decisions here. Not only are you trying to build your own, but you've got to be careful about what you're giving your opponent as well. And it's really clever. One of, one of the best two-player games out there, to be honest. And you know, you might think, all this positive praise, why did this leave the collection? Um, I went for a really long period of not playing any two-player games at all. They were just sat on the shelf, never being looked at. And um, I think this was a casualty, a casualty of that. It just wasn't getting played because I always played with more than two players. However, more recently, I do play with more two-player games. Recently, I've got a big kind of collection of two-player games into, into, my, um, into my library. And I'm starting to feel like I might want to get this one back because it is certainly one of the better ones out there. It's precise, it's well-balanced, it's neat, it's smart, it's clever, and again, plays in that 15 to 20 minute mark. So, and, and on top of that, all that is, is dirt cheap as well. So I think I might get this one back, making uh, this... Uh, making this little speech a bit void, but we'll see. So uh, that is the Tides of Time. So I hope that gives you some insight about what process goes on in my head when I'm trying to get rid of games from my collection. I have limited space, so I'm always looking forward or always looking to try and cull it down as much as I can and even try to find reasons to get rid of these games. So uh, regardless of that, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. And for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.